exact opposite thing is we're acting with dispatch. We're acting, committing to what we said we would do. And Sanders just laid out, General, all of the foreign leaders who have criticized this. Does he really believe this thing has drawn praise from around the world? Yeah, yeah I mean, it's a stunning revelation. This is the president of the United States, folks. I mean, he's surrounded by people who have access to global information. There's a presidential daily briefing. It's not just about intelligence. It's about other things that are happening uh, that are impacting the United States. And certainly it's a very unusual thing for our NATO allies to openly criticize the president of the United States for his actions in Afghanistan and to have that as universal criticism. And you're telling me that no one has told the president of the United States that? I mean, that's, that, that's pretty outrageous. Secondly, he is standing up there and looking us in the face and telling us there's no al-Qaeda left in Afghanistan. Now, that's, that's just not factual. The fact is, even in open source UN reporting, the United Nations has reported that the Taliban is in 15 different provinces inside of Afghanistan. That, that's the reality. And, and we got to deal with that, that reality. I, I'm stunned that he still is holding to that kind of information. And this open horizon thing, we are going to track the development of international terrorism inside of Afghanistan from over the horizon. Remember what has happened here. We had a huge intelligence, robust capability that we wanted to keep in place. It's publicly disclosed that we had a significant CIA presence on the ground whose number one task was to stay focused on the Al-Qaeda. After all, it's from their capability that we went on to kill Osama bin Laden, who's across the border in Pakistan. So that is gone. How do we track and maintain eyes and ears of what is happening with international terrorists, to include the Al-Qaeda, inside of Afghanistan when we lost the eyes and ears of our intel community on the ground, when we lost the eyes and ears of the Afghan people, when we lost the eyes and ears of all the Afghan troops that used to be out there reporting what is going on in, in their neighborhood. This is wishful thinking to a fault. And to continue to use that term, it gives us a false impression that we're going to be able to effectively track the uh, uh, al-Qaeda and radical Islamists and then intervene militarily as we have done over the past 20 years uh, to keep these folks down. I, I'm stunned by some of these, uh, by some of these comments. It, it makes no sense whatsoever in terms of what reality is. As Jennifer Griffin just said, it appears he's living in alternate reality to your point about what he said. Biden uh, did claim his own words, Al-Qaeda is now gone in Afghanistan. General Keene, before he spoke, uh, you said you wanted to hear a very specific mission as to how we are going to get those Americans home. Here is what he said on that, his promise. Listen. Well, let me be clear. Any American who wants to come home, we will get you home. Make no mistake, this evacuation mission is dangerous. It involves risks to our armed forces, and it's being conducted under difficult circumstances. But went on to say we still don't have an exact number of Americans there. Uh, we know the Pentagon said they didn't know. We know the State Department didn't have an exact number. And Joe Biden just said we want to get a strong number as to exactly how many people are there, how many American citizens uh, are there. Did he show you any change in action? Or was this just words? Rick Grinnell just tweeted out, no personnel adjustments. The White House thinks everything went great. In the wake of how this is all unfolded, did you think that perhaps there should have been some sort of announced change in leadership even from the White House? Well, I, 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 I do take solace in the sense that he said we'll mobilize all resources to accomplish this mission. Totally agree with that. However, that does seem to be a little out of line with what Secretary Austin was saying the other day when he said, I don't have the resources necessary to go outside the gate to facilitate movement of people through all the Taliban checkpoints. And and what he's referring to there, I, I take it he doesn't have the resources, but he also, he doesn't have permission. I don't think we've done anything to alleviate that. And the president, I don't think he, he truly gets it. 
that yes, American citizens, not all, but most, are transiting through Taliban checkpoints with passport in hand. But most and very few of the Afghans are getting through those checkpoints, even though they have documentation in hand which justifies their exit from the Kabul airport and, and to a destination. That is what is being constipated. And it stopped, and, and he's clueless that we're never going to be able to accomplish the mission that he has given himself, which is to extract all of our Afghan partners. I think what, I, what he's really saying to us, we're going to do the best that we can. And I don't feel that same resolve and determination to get this done, all available resources, regardless of how long it takes. And he should be out there telling his military, guys, get out there and figure out what we need to do to break through these checkpoints. We'll get the Taliban involved in it, but if they don't cooperate, I need you to get our people through those checkpoints and find alternate places to pick them up where they don't all have to come immediately to the airport to make this a little bit easier on everybody. Yeah. General Kane, stand by, if you will, sir. Thank you. We've got a great insight from you. Uh, Sandra? Thanks, General. Our Fox, uh, Fox News uh, team has been waiting on all this, uh, everything Afghanistan, not just recently, but for some of them since the very beginning of this war over 20 years ago. Those decades of experience can help us all understand how this crisis is playing out in this moment. Of course, Jennifer Griffin still with us, along with us, Benjamin Hall, Steve Harrigan, Harrigan Aisha Hosni. Uh, thanks to all of you uh, for your coverage of this war and now this crisis. Steve Harrigan, to you first on what we just heard from the president. I'm scared of a couple of things, and I'm scared, first of all, as to what could happen next, because we're talking about several thousand potential hostages, which the Taliban will know how to use to get as much as they want. This could go very bad very soon. The other thing that really scares me is just how wrong they were and how surprised they were about the army that they built, the Afghan National Army. I remember going to a graduation training class of Afghan soldiers, and they all spun their diplomas around because they didn't know which letters were up. None of them could read after graduation. Anyone who's been around Afghan national government soldiers know that you have to do a mission before payday, because when payday comes, they all disappear. And if they're supposed to work with the U.S. troops, they might be an hour late, they might be days late. Anyone who's been on the ground in Afghanistan knows about this force. How did he and his Rhodes Scholar advisors be completely fooled by this? Yeah, and it's a good point. Benjamin Hall, to you, when you when you listen to the president, and we talked about this earlier, when he actually comes out and he says, listen, uh, you know, we believe that our allies think that, you know, we did a good job on this, and we have kind of read the reaction from the EU leader calling it a catastrophe and so on. You have a better kind of concept of what is happening and what the feeling is around the rest of the world. Were you surprised by that statement, Benjamin? Absolutely devoid of reality, Trace. It's remarkable. Just a couple of days ago, we watched MPs in the parliament here stand up one after the other and categorically say they would not have left Afghanistan. They were left in the dark about this departure. They were scrambling to keep up. And the bigger question now for so many of them is what does the future of NATO look like? A lot of them are even laughing. They're saying President Biden campaigned on the idea that some America is back like it disappeared. And they're saying this is the nail in the coffin. How can we possibly trust an American alliance if we have to fight one in the future with, against China, perhaps, if this is how they're going to treat us? And he said very clearly today, we went in as a coalition, a NATO coalition. We are leaving as a NATO coalition. That is simply not true. And the same has been said across European nations, the Kurdish, the Germans, and the French. In fact, the head of Germany's CDU party, Merkel's successor, has said this is the death knell for NATO. I mean, it, it is remarkable to hear him say that. And frankly, uh, you know, it's bizarre because it not only does it give no solace to allies in the West, it gives zero solace to the allies in Afghanistan right now. For the tens of thousands of Afghans who have worked with us in the past, uh, many of whom we've spoken to in the last few days, they will still be cowering in their houses, terrified that that knock on the door is coming their way with no idea how to get help. And the idea that the French and the British are going outside the wire, bringing people in, and the US isn't, that's gonna be a huge affront to them. President Biden just there said that they were giving overhead support to the French so they could go into Kabul and pull people out, but they weren't doing so because they thought it might lead to an escalation. The Taliban 
clearly are not terribly afraid of President Biden right now. He's more afraid of them attacking him. Uh, and at the moment, they are reliant entirely, uh, the U.S. is reliant entirely on Taliban goodwill for allowing people to get inside that airport. It, it is frankly baffling right now. So, you know. Benjamin, thank you for your perspective on that. Aisha Hasmi, your thoughts on what we just heard? A couple of things. I just want to add on to what Benjamin Hall said about, you know, the Taliban um, sort of scaring everyone around the world, including, I would say, I want to bring in, of course, uh, what's going on in Pakistan, the Pakistani prime minister uh, essentially saying, we don't want to be a part of this war anymore. And he uh, pretty squarely laid the blame on uh, the U.S. for all the suicide bombings that have been going off in Pakistan by the Pakistani Taliban um, because of their involvement with the U.S. government in fighting the war on terror. But I also want to bring up, I don't know if anyone noticed that there was this question that multiple reporters kept asking in different ways of the president that he never quite um, answered. Um, it, was, it was about, obviously you're going to have uh, U.S. citizens that will be able to show their passport, their blue passport at these checkpoints to be able to get through. But what about the allies, the translators, the linguists, the people who have been helping uh, U.S. forces on the ground? How are they supposed to get to the airport? Because I have in my hands right now documents for a translator trapped in Kabul in a house right now, hiding out with his wife and his four children, absolutely terrified. He can't leave the house. He hasn't gotten approval yet from the U.S. government to come to the airport, and he's wondering how he's even going to make it to the airport because of these Afghani uh, Taliban checkpoints. And then you think about the people who are even further away from Kabul right now, like in Kandahar. That is 300 miles away from yeah, Kabul. Yeah, General Keane was making that point. I should, to, to your point, our team has this, uh, we, can, we can roll the tape on exactly what you're saying. When he was pressed on those that are getting blocked heading to the airport, Here's how he responds. Okay, all right, I can tell you, he said, we have no indication that they haven't been able to get in Kabul through the airport. That's remarkable when you right. know there are many stories like that out there that you just shared. It's terrifying because I have friends that have families on the ground, in the ground right now, and they're telling their family members, please reach out to anyone that you know at the U.S. Embassy. They're asking me for email addresses, contact numbers to reach out to anyone at the embassy. They have no way of contacting the U.S. government on the ground right now um, because there is so much chaos. And what they're looking for is just the green light. They don't want to go out of their homes until they have the green light to be able to travel right, so we're to gonna the airport. That. Here, here's how he defended it, SAT 14. We're in constant contact with the Taliban, working to ensure civilians have safe passage to the airport. We are particularly focused on our engagements on making sure every American who wants to leave can get to the airport. Where we have been seeing challenges with Americans for, for Americans, we have thus far been able to resolve them. We've been able, we've made, look, we, we, we've made clear to the Taliban that any attack, any attack on our forces or disruption of our operations at the airport will be met with swift and forceful response. Aisha. Yeah, again, just specifically, he's talking about American citizens, and while that is incredible and amazing to hear, what about the people that have helped Americans on the ground? There are hundreds of them all over the place. I know my friends have family members who are um, translators and linguists, and they are trapped, essentially. They cannot leave until they get that green light from the U.S. Embassy on the ground to make it to the airport. And then, uh, keep in mind, you know, in my hands, all these documents, this is what they'll be carrying with them. And this is exactly what the Taliban are looking for, documents that link them to the U.S. government, and that is what they're afraid of. I should stand by Jennifer Griffin. Uh, about 10 minutes ago, the best Pentagon reporter in the business said on our air that she couldn't fact check uh, the president's speech fast enough. That, of course, would be you. We gave you a few minutes. Did you come up with anything else, Jennifer, that you thought might have been a little unusual for the president to include in this speech? Well, I think what struck me, uh, Trace, and I just want to mention that my relationship to Afghanistan and Pakistan goes back to 1993 when I lived in Islamabad and began going to Afghanistan. And what the president said today is that the U.S. has no national interest in Afghanistan. And what, rung, what, what I remembered is that is what successive American presidents, President Bush, H.W. Uh, Bush said 
after the Soviets pulled out and after the U.S. had provided Stinger missiles to the Mujahideen, uh, weapons that we didn't get back and which uh, created the seeds for Al-Qaeda. What is shocking to me is how little understanding of that region after 20 years of war that leaving a vacuum in Afghanistan, the pre President Biden said we have no U.S. national interest in Afghanistan. Well, when we tried to pull out of the region, and when I was a young reporter, I was in my 20s, living in Islamabad, uh, one of just a handful of reporters going back and forth to Afghanistan, listening to visiting uh, intelligence officers from Washington, coming through State Department officials telling us that the Taliban were actually a good idea because uh, they would come and bring peace and, and calm to Afghanistan after the civil war that broke out when the Soviets pulled out. Well, I, I can tell you, you fast forward to a few weeks from now, a few months to now, from now, we already see signs that the Afghans are starting to, uh, the resistance will start to uh, build with, with groups in the Panjshir Valley, um, uh, descendants of Amin Shah Massoud and other uh, leaders, warlords that go back to that post-Soviet period and civil war. They are going to come back. There will be a civil war in Afghanistan, and U.S. Military commanders knew it, they told the White House about it, and the President was willing to leave a civil war behind in Afghanistan, saying that there's no U.S. national interest. But we know what happened in Iraq when the U.S. pulled out, when President Biden was Vice President Biden, and the same national security team uh, told us that they could pull out of Iraq uh, with no consequences. Three years later, U.S. troops were sent in to fight ISIS. So this notion that there's no U.S. national interest in Afghanistan is really a little hard to stomach from my perch after seeing that the same things were said back in 1993 to 95 uh, before the Taliban came and gave uh, bases to al-Qaeda and bin Laden. Just remember that without intelligence bases in Afghanistan, without partners in Afghanistan, we couldn't carry out the mission against bin Laden that uh, U.S. troops did 10 years ago. All of those things, we've just gone dark in a part of the world that is very dark. And I can tell you, it is like Groundhog Day, listening to the words coming out of the White House about how the U.S. does not have a national interest in that region. Great context and perspective. Jennifer Griffin, stand by. Steve Harrigan, um, and you have um, covered many terrorist attacks over the years. Um, the president was just asked, asked about the threat now of terror and, and and the threat that we face here in the homeland, and he said this, listen. The threat from terrorism has metastasized. There's a greater danger from ISIS and, 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 and Al Qaeda and all the affiliates and other countries by far than there is from Afghanistan. We're gonna retain an over the horizon capability. That because as the Taliban takes over Afghanistan, we do wonder what the threat is here at home. I do think this story could get a lot worse, and what I'm interested in is if that happens, how much attention, how important is that going to be to Americans? Often, I've seen it before, when a country is beaten in a war, when a country is humiliated, there are huge repercussions. This story has happened before. The Soviets in 1989 had to leave with their tail between their legs, although they did it in an orderly parade after 10 years in Afghanistan. They lost, their empire was defeated and really had a huge effect. Many people think it helped bring down the Soviet Union. It really broke trust in government. How angry, how upset are people going to be about this? What are the implications here domestically, especially if this goes south? I try and look for ways of how this can be solved, and I just see it getting worse, much worse, every direction. You know, Steve Harrigan, I go back to looking at you back in 2001, and you were the only correspondent out there. You had a photographer, there was one light in the middle of a field, and that's the only coverage that was coming out of Afghanistan for a while. You were working for somebody else at the time, and I remember the president of this network said, get that guy, work him for us, and you became a member of Fox News Channel, an invaluable one. But Steve, when, when you hear the President of the United States now saying that they are really trusting the Taliban. They literally are trusting the Taliban to play by the rules during this evacuation of Americans and our Afghan partners. What do you think about that? Uh, you know, that's just patently absurd, I think, anyone who's dealt with them. And you're pointing to back to those days. It's been a real strange vision for me to see this happen so quickly when the Taliban 
took over so many cities so quickly because it was almost like the exact reverse of 2001. The Northern Alliance takes this city, this city, this city, Kunduz, Mazar. The Taliban has just flipped the script. You know, these are not people who fight to the last man. And some people say, oh, you know, they're, they're cowards, but they've defeated the U.S. They've defeated the Soviet Empire. They've defeated the British Empire. This is a kind of strategy of melting back into the public, waiting your chance, developing weapons like IEDs, making them more and more powerful, evolving and waiting. And they've come back and defeated three major empires in the last 200 years. Great. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you for that. Um, and, and especially that look back as well. Benjamin Hall has been reporting very recently from Afghanistan. We were also showing images of you, video of you, uh, reporting on the ground there. And we think about what is happening there right now in this moment with such a growing fear for the people there. You have seen a, a great transition over the years of your reporting on the ground there as well. Yeah, and I wonder if the producers might just start rolling this clip from the beginning with the sound, because this was in November. And one of the things which uh, I heard back then, which has been so hotly debated, is whether or not there was intelligence uh, that Kabul would fall so quickly. This is what we reported last November. Take a listen. And the Taliban are in control. Night after night, they launch attacks on police checkpoints, and they take over districts like this. They are knocking on Kabul. Districts like this are taken over by the Taliban at night. When night falls, they come in, they put up roadblocks, they arrest and kill people who work for the government. The people who work in night after night, they launch attacks on police checkpoints. Well, and there they you go. I mean, back in November, we were speaking to people and we were going out around Kabul in some parts, and they were telling us then that at night time, the Taliban came and took over parts of Kabul. They were going out, looking for people who work for the Afghan government and killing them. You know, the idea that there wasn't intelligence, that the Taliban were inside Kabul or ready to take it over is ridiculous. And they had kill lists that people were worried about. They knew who, were working, who was working for the Americans back then. They were going out systematically targeting them. And outside Kabul, when we were speaking to people uh, around it, they also said, at nighttime, this area is all controlled by the Taliban. We have no control here. Uh, and so to hear the president say time and time again, well, the intelligence was a bit vague. We, you know, we didn't think it would fall as quickly. Well, we were reporting this back in November that it was absolutely ready to fall. I will add an interesting point, which is a lot of the people we spoke to outside of the city, some of them, quite a few of them said to us, you know what, after 20 years, we would actually welcome the Taliban back into our villages. Because in some of these rural areas where war had been going on for so long, where Afghan National Army had been fighting the Taliban and they were killing, 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 there were some people who said, you know what, bring in the Taliban as long as it brings peace and we accept the harsh rule of reality of that world. Of course, it's totally different in these cities. A, si a city of six million like Kabul, well, those are people who have never experienced anything but freedom. And they're the ones who today will have be coming to terms with a whole new reality. And to hear President Biden saying, oh, we are gonna push for and think about the human rights and the liberty of women, and we're gonna do everything we can to make sure that's the case in Afghanistan. How are you going to do that? That, that is absolutely impossible to check. And unless, he says, except for commitments from the Taliban is what we're going to do. We're going to get commitments from the Taliban. Uh, not going to happen. That's a very fair